Herbert, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. It's very kind of you to have invited me today. I was looking forward to quite some uh, time. And I'd also like to uh, thank those who've helped you organize this uh, event and the individuals who have come uh, and are going to listen for uh, some time. Human beings have wandered over the surface of the earth for many thousands of years and have sailed uh, the oceans or somehow made their way across bits of uh, water, yet they've known nothing about uh, the weather and the atmosphere or really what goes on in uh, the oceans for some time. People, for example, in London, knew that in general it was warmer in June than it uh, would be in December, but even that wasn't absolutely sure. A week ago, in the middle of my playing tennis, it started to snow, so it was <laughs> April. Um, one really knew very little uh, indeed. And an example, oh, why doesn't this work now? Work just uh, there goes. Uh, an example uh, was uh, uh, that uh, on November 26, which happens to be my birthday, but in 1703, I was not around then, whatever it might look, um, there was an incredible storm that swept through the south of England. It went at about 50 miles an hour which was faster than horses could gallop to give information. So nobody knew what was uh, going on and it caused incredible troubles over all of uh, Southern uh, England because it was totally unanticipated. Many hundreds of people lost their lives just in uh, London. It came through, if I may be a little parochial, into King's uh, College where I'm a uh, fellow and blew down three of the pinnacles that you see here, not the two big ones, but the uh, smaller ones. Now, that's a well-established fact that it uh, blew down those three pinnacles. And also I worked out or found out that the cost of repairing them today would be about a half a million pounds. But I've asked the uh, librarian who's looked into uh, the accounts of Kings and nowhere can she find the equivalent amount uh, being uh, somehow paid in 1703. Whether the provost paid for it out of his pocket or whether the builder decided to do it for nothing, we have no idea. Anyhow, but that was definitely a major storm that caused lots of problems and totally unprepared for. Uh, then there was a big disaster, an interesting disaster, the Royal Charter was a ship that was bringing uh, people uh, from Australia, actually, to Wales. And there were lots of Welsh people and something like 600 on the uh, Royal Charter. And uh, very close to land, many of the people who survived, only 50 survived with the 600, many of the people who survived said they could see their own houses. They were so close, but it was a disaster. They got caught in a terrible uh, storm. The ship was wrecked. Most people uh, died. And yet there were ships just a few miles further off the Welsh coast who said they hadn't seen anything at all. They hadn't known what was uh, going on. So it was really quite uh, local. Now I'd like to talk about uh, how the development happened in terms of three people. That says something about me, but I'm interested in people. Uh, Matthew Marry on the left, who I'll talk about first, Robert Fitzroy, who will be second, and then uh, L.F. Uh, Richardson. To so start with uh, Marry, he's uh, known as the pathfinder of the seas, and he joined the uh, U.S. Navy when he was quite uh, young, and he was on the USS Vincenzi's, which in 1826 was the first naval vessel to circumnavigate uh, the globe, and in particular, it went uh, through the Antarctic, or the waters of the Antarctic. From the word go, he was very interested 
in the waves that he saw, the weather that caused those waves, and he took very good notes of everything and tried somehow to understand them. He also went around Cape Horn, which was a very difficult uh, business in those days. Uh, there could be enormous waves, and he took lots of notes and some understanding uh, there. Then uh, one day when he was about 35, uh, he was traveling in a coach like uh, this, and the coach stopped to pick up a, a woman a passenger, but there wasn't enough space in the coach. And so Maori, very much the Southern gentleman said, oh, I'll ride up with the driver, that's okay, you uh, come in. So off they took, and what unfortunately Maori didn't know is that the driver was known to be incompetent, smashed the whole uh, business, and this broke uh, Maori's femur in 1839, when he was about 35. Well, the Navy, what could they do? They couldn't fire him. After all, he'd been a wonderful Southern gentleman. He hadn't done anything wrong. So after some thought, they said, you know what? Since the US Navy has been in existence since about 1750, We've asked all captains to make uh, records of the wind and wave conditions that they've encountered. And we've kept them in uh, a big uh, place in Washington. Why don't you come through and have a look? And Mary thought that was fascinating. And he was really the first person to look at the data. It was said that he worked 14 hours a day and was really very serious about it. Then during his time, uh, there was a terrible sinking of uh, the Arctic and Maori said, and now I'm making this a little uh, more simple, gee, this uh, happened at night because two ships collided. Why don't we have shipping lanes? Uh, now, that's the sort of thing that uh, we'd known on land for hundreds of years. In Britain, uh, we uh, rode on the left so that we'd have our right hand free for there was a sword fight. But uh, he invented shipping lanes. He also used the data to decrease the average shipping time across the Atlantic considerably by telling ships how far north or south they should go, or what uh, times there were rather in general, or statistically storms and things like that. Then unfortunately the Civil War uh, came about and Maori coming from the south fought for the southerners. He invented uh, electric torpedoes, which were directed against the, the northern ships. And he was responsible for the killing of more Northerners than any other Southerner. Because of this, well, first let me say, uh, he uh, wrote a uh, book, The Physical Geography of the Sea, and had a book written uh, about him, The Father of Oceanography. And I can't help but say that, and I'm not going to say where this happened, I gave a, a talk and I wanted this book, The Physical Geography of the Sea, uh, but I didn't have the right to borrow from that library, so I asked a very well-known uh, oceanographer at that university, would he please uh, borrow the book for me? And he did that, and uh, when he first saw it, he thumbed through it of interest, he hadn't seen it before, and then he threw it to the ground and he said, there are no equations here. It's all words, that's no good, <laughs> which I thought was uh, interesting. But Maori definitely was the beginner of the understanding of uh, ocean uh, waves. This is a photograph of him in 1855. He had difficulty when the Civil War was uh, over and uh, he moved to France because he was not really liked that much in the US for obvious reasons. He did an enormous amount for the French government, uh, telling them about uh, the weather and what to anticipate, but all in some sense qualitative. He had no mathematical uh, knowledge or background. He got the Légion d'honneur and it was awarded for reasons I don't understand in London uh, at the French embassy and the French ambassador gave him the Légion d'honneur on a Thursday. And that's an important point that I'll come back to uh, later. 
The other point I'll make, which I find fascinating, and this is partly for John Gould, um, is that uh, at a Zoom uh, conversation about a year ago, uh, someone at Woods Hole, when I mentioned Mary, got very annoyed with me, a, a good colleague and somebody I get on very well with, and said, here's a southerner. I really want to get rid of his uh, statue in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Library and Maori Lane. I definitely want to get that uh, changed. And I thought, well, there it is. But he was a remarkable guy. Uh, there's a big, nice statue of him in uh, Virginia uh, that uh, has been around for quite uh, some time. Now, I'd like to say something about Fitzroy. Fitzroy was a remarkable guy, and I could easily talk for a whole hour, in fact, two hours, just about uh, Fitzroy. He did many, many uh, remarkable things. He was the great-grandson of Charles II. It was a well-known fact that uh, Charles had a uh, mistress, Barbara Villiers, who uh, bore him five uh, children, and she was described as, as I've written here, tall, voluptuous, with a highly sensuous mouth. Now, can you imagine these days a king or a prime minister having five illegitimate children? That's very difficult to imagine. But somehow, uh, Charles got away uh, with it. And uh, Robert Fitzroy was one of them. He lived in this, he grew up in a very wealthy uh, family. He lived in this uh, wonderful house with uh, grounds from four to 12. Uh, he then entered the Navy, much to his father's annoyance. His father was an army man. Uh, unfortunately, Fitzroy's mother died when he was five and his father died and Fitzroy hardly saw him when uh, Fitzroy was about 16. He was at sea at the time and was told that his father had uh, died. Um, he took uh, a vessel as uh, the sort of second in command down to Argentina, and uh, this is Mount Fitzroy that was uh, named after him. When he, oh, at age 21, he passed with full numbers his uh, exam results. That's the naval nomenclature for full marks, full numbers. Uh, he was the first person to do that and only two or three people have done it uh, since. When he was 23, the command of his uh, boat, the Beagle, um, in uh, the Southern Ocean committed suicide. And so uh, he took over as command, aged uh, 23. Quite a remarkable uh, character. He then uh, took the second voyage, basically the Beagle, on which uh, Darwin uh, was uh, also a, a member for five years. Um, and this is a sketch of uh, the Beagle. Uh, and Darwin and Fitzroy argued a lot with each other. Uh, that's an interesting business. And I'm just partly to be controversial, as I'm going to say, I think Fitzroy was a better scientist and a more important scientist than Darwin. And I say that partly because I'm sure people will disagree, but I know there are a lot of people who do agree. Anyhow, to give you an indication of uh, Fitzroy's ability, at one stage, he came across three giant waves in uh, the Beagle, what we'd now call road waves, and three in a row hit the ship. And uh, Fitzroy, who was a wonderful uh, keeper of diaries, said, I was very, very lucky. A fourth one, and I wouldn't have been able to sail and keep the uh, vessel uh, okay. His second in command wrote, any other commander of the ship would have downed it in the first uh, road wave. Fitzroy was remarkable. He got us through all three. And I think it does say something about Fitzroy's modesty and ability. He could <clears throat> really do some wonderful things. <coughs> he brought from uh, Tierra del Fuego these three guys, and that's a fascinating story in itself. Um, they were presented at court and were a great uh, hit. Uh, and uh, they went back, and that's another long story. <coughs> 
Uh, Fitzroy realized that uh, the pressure in the atmosphere and its change was very important. And he got together the idea of a barometer and used to record uh, the barometric pressure and what weather followed it. So he really had some understanding of being able to predict when bad weather would uh, come. This is not a, uh, a painting of uh, Fitzroy, but I, it is in my mind. I always think this is Fitzroy looking out over the uh, Southern Ocean, which he understood so very well. Now, he came, well, there's a lot one could tell about uh, Fitzroy, but uh, after having been uh, the uh, uh, Governor General of New Zealand, where he was hated, absolutely hated, because he was religious, and he made statements like uh, when he saw that the uh, Englishmen, with respect, who'd come out to New Zealand were taking all the land of the Maoris, he said, we have to consider the Maoris. We have to really, we can't just ruin their lives like this. And uh, the new settlers said, why the hell? We want this land, and some of them had even paid for it in England. And Fitzroy, being very, very religious, said, because they're made by God, just like us. What? Those savages? Blech. And he was hung in effigy. Anyhow, he came back. He uh, <clears throat> was uh, the first director of the Met Office. He set up the Met Office with, and you might like to consider this, a staff of three. The Met Office now, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure 3,000 would uh, be an underestimate. And the first uh, weather forecast, which was totally due to Fitzroy in the Met Office in 1861, said the north, it'll be moderate westerly wind and fine. The west, moderate southwesterly and fine. And the south, fresh westerlies and fine. And that was not bad. Much better, I'm afraid to say, than some of the future forecasts. Not that easy to uh, do. This is now an indication from uh, the Times. There was details of the barometric pressure that's uh, in the first column, uh, the different uh, cities. And this is the sort of detail that was obtained. And what was very important and definitely Fitzroy's idea was that uh, he set up recording stations throughout Great Britain, initially a dozen, who would... Uh, uh, telegraph down, because the telegraph had just been invented, telegraph down to uh, London what the, in particular, the barometric pressure was and what it uh, looked like. <laughs> in some sense, this got him into enormous trouble because it was so successful that he decided he'd expand. And instead of having 12 around the Great Britain, he'd have 24. In order to do that, he needed some money. In order to do that, he needed to ask Parliament, who were responsible, to give him some money. He'd had some particular difficulties with Parliament, and some of the parliamentarians laughed at the idea, refused to give him the money, and said, ah, these stupid forecasts, you know, they're wrong half the time. <laughs> That's exactly what was said. I wonder what the guy would say now. Anyhow, uh, he uh, was uh, elected to uh, the Royal Society, and this is the certificate of election, and it's signed by some 13 people. And I show this in part because, you see, Charles Darwin is the last signature. Um, and the uh, librarian at the Royal Society and I have a wonderful argument, and both of us love this argument because both of us know that neither can be proved correct. The fact is that Charles Darwin is last. And my interpretation is that Darwin didn't want to sign and he was forced into it and had to sign. And uh, Keith Moore, the librarian's interpretation is that Darwin really came up to uh, town and he just happened to be last. Interesting discussion. But the telegraph line was really very important. Uh, the first telegraph line to transmit information about the weather and how changes would take place so you didn't have the terrible storm as in uh, 1703 in London um, was in uh, America and uh, by 1848 there were over 2,000 miles of telegraph lines. Some of you may have heard from my accent, I'm an Australian, so I put in this uh, Australian little uh, bit. Uh, 
that uh, a little later, there was a line in Australia from Melbourne uh, to Williamston, and then Australia was linked to the world uh, by a very long telegraph uh, line that uh, went from the southern end, Adelaide, to Darwin. And that was initiated by a man called Alex Todd, and his wife was called Alice. And that's how Alice Springs comes about because he set up, it's really a fabulous place. You can have a look at the telegraphic station. I was there some three years ago um, uh, at uh, Alice uh, Springs. Now, Fitzroy's uh, Met Office had 15 such telegraph stations at one stage, and then it went more, as I uh, said. Now, just to give you an indication of what that was like, there are now something like four and a half thousand uh, reporting stations on the surface. Of course, uh, satellites and things like that uh, make it uh, more. Now, uh, this is the park, Clark, to uh, Fitzroy, where he lived in his last few days. Another interesting story that Fitzroy, the deeply religious Fitzroy, said to his second wife one Sunday morning, um, I'm just going downstairs to shave and then I'm going off to church. And he went downstairs and slit his throat. Now, why a uh, religious man slits their throat on a Sunday morning is something that many people have wondered about. And one thing I'll, even conjecture is too strong, I'll throw up in the air is to say that uh, when uh, Mary was given his Légion d'honneur uh, in London, uh, Fitzroy came. He wasn't invited, but it was relatively open. It was all right. And he came on that Thursday. And uh, the ambassador, apparently, when uh, the ceremony was almost over, said, oh, no, 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 we have another important weather forecaster in our midst. We should acknowledge uh, Robert Fitzroy is here. And I just wonder, because that was two day, three days before he uh, committed suicide, whether that just turned him over. He was so upset that he hadn't been recognized where he was a much more important uh, guy than uh, Maori, there's no doubt about it. Anyhow, I'd now like to go on to talk about uh, Lewis Fry Richardson, who also uh, deserves at least an hour uh, discussion. He was nicknamed the prof and uh, on a, a biography of him on the very front cover it says was prof short for professor or prophet. He was really such a wide-ranging guy. He was an undergraduate at my college, uh, King's uh, College, and after he'd finished his undergraduate work he went up north where he came from to work for a peak company. Now, one of the important things about Pete that uh, caused him a lot of difficulty was when do you actually mine it in a sense? How much water flows through? Once it rains, how long will it take before that water dries? And so he decided that he'd look into solving the equations of water flow through porous peat. The flow of fluid in porous media had been looked at uh, by Darcy, the Frenchman, and others. So he got the equations and he solved them. But it's not easy to solve uh, these nonlinear equations, and you have to take certain steps. Now, these days, we take steps that are sufficiently small because we have powerful computers, but he did it, of course, all by hand, and he had to take rather big steps. And he then took slightly smaller steps and used a technique or devised a technique we now call Richardson's extrapolation to the limit when it's very small steps. Um, and it's still used today. Now, he wrote this up for a so-called research fellowship at uh, King's, um, an idea which is now uh, 100 years later, more than 100 years later, still right at the top. Anyhow, uh, Kings didn't know any science in those days. It was a totally humanities uh, college. And so it uh, sent the uh, dissertation up the road to Trinity, uh, 
where they had mathematicians like Hardy and uh, Ramunujan and people like that. Anyhow, back came the report, which I've seen, which said more or less, yuck, numerical methods. That's not, that's not mathematics. That's not the way to proceed. This is hopeless. And uh, so he didn't get uh, the uh, fellowship. Then the war started. Uh, he was very much a uh, Quaker, and so he wouldn't get uh, involved in the fighting, but he joined uh, the ambulance, the Quakers ambulance, and he came very close to the front quite often. He took to war with him the uh, data uh, of it's weather. Sorry, the data of weather on a uh, Sunday morning at six and laboriously over four months calculated what the weather would be like at midday on that day. He, of course, knew well what the answer should be. He also got it hopelessly, hopelessly wrong because he, he it is said that he sat on bales of hay for hours and hours for some uh, four months, and that's why I showed this photograph. He used a grid which was some 200 kilometers uh, in the horizontal in each direction and about two kilometers uh, in the uh, vertical and then took it forward at uh, three quarters of an hour at a time. That took him four months of hard work. We now know that that time scale, three quarters of an hour was much, much uh, too long. But he couldn't have known that, that wasn't done until much uh, later. So it wasn't uh, very uh, good. He then had the idea after the war was over, look, maybe what would be needed is to get a whole group of people, some 64,000 he uh, worked out, to come into the Albert Hall, for example. One group would represent Australia, one would represent Canada, USA, blah, 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 blah. They would be under the guise of a conductor, as you see here, and the Australian bit would uh, calculate the weather and then when it went off across uh, the Pacific to the US, they'd pass it across and, and so on and so on. It turns out we now know that he was wrong, the things that he wanted to do, which of course very uh, uh, trivial by our standards now and what was needed, would have needed 256,000, not 64,000 uh, human computers. And that's to be compared with what we do now we compute in petaflops, which is a billion, billion calculations each second. So you can imagine uh, 256 people, they would do one calculation every five seconds, 10 seconds or something like that. So well beyond what he'd uh, thought about and imagined. And so of course he didn't get very good uh, results. Nevertheless, he uh, had an important book, uh, Weather Prediction by Numerical Processes, uh, uh, published, even the second edition. And in some sense, the most famous thing about the book is this poem, Big Worlds Have Little Worlds, which feed on their velocity, and little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. And that summarizes the uh, problem. We have huge big movements in the atmosphere, hundreds or tens, hundreds of kilometers across, and those big tornadoes and worlds, they transfer their energy to smaller worlds and then smaller worlds. And finally, what was originally scales of tens or hundreds of kilometers, lose all the energy in scales of just centimeters, even less than centimeters. And it's that change that really causes all the difficulties. Now, another thing that Richardson did is he was terribly bothered as a Quaker after the war, having seen the terrible things. If he took the data starting from 1550, 1650, 1750, 1850, up to his recent time, peace-loving country, Great Britain, had been involved in more wars than any other country. And he couldn't understand that. And for reasons that I don't think 
anybody understood, he wondered whether the propensity of going to war was dependent on the perimeter of the country, not on the population or on the number who voted conservative or whatever, but on the perimeter. Now, the perimeter of a rectangle is pretty easy to work out, but the perimeter of Great Britain, not that easy. So what he did was he got a big map of uh, Great Britain, put it down on a table, got some dividers, put them 250 kilometers apart or on scale 250 kilometers and just traced around Great Britain. And he got a length of the perimeter. He then changed it to 25 uh, kilometers, went round, and of course got a larger value because there were more of the inlets taken into account. Then he put it to 2.5 kilometers and he got an even larger value. And this was the beginnings of what is now known as fractals, fractal dimensions, very important uh, aspect. And Richardson wrote about that and understood it in the early-ish 20s. Mandelbrot then rediscovered the idea in 1970 and it took him about 20 years before he finally agreed that Richardson had done it before him. So there was Mandelbrot in the 70s, Richardson in the 20s, but as an Australian who's been in England for a long time, I'm going to tell you it was discovered even earlier. Here's Matthew Flinders, said to be the first person to have uh, navigated uh, around Australia, but it's not true, or it's not necessarily true. What is true, he was the first Britisher. There could have been indigenous people who uh, did it. But he took with him his cat, which you see here. This is at Euston uh, Station. And he's got uh, his dividers out measuring the perimeter of uh, Great uh, Britain. So I say Matthew Flinders deserves all the credit and he evaluated uh, fractals at uh, Euston long before uh, uh, those who get the credit for it. Here, this is the uh, Civic of Election of uh, uh, Richardson to uh, the Royal Society. There's some interesting names here. Uh, Tommy Gold, uh, Harold uh, Jeffries, uh, G.I. Taylor, the famous uh, fluid uh, dynamicist. Uh, Richardson went to be head of Paisley College. He, uh, in some sense, left fluid dynamics and became interested in psychology. Well, this is partly due to the deadly weapon, a uh, deadly, uh, statistically deadly weapon, uh, deadly, uh, and he worked uh, uh, with Hank Stommel, a very famous oceanographer, uh, and they went to Loch Long uh, up in Scotland and threw bits of parsnip into the loch and watched how they separated because Richardson had an idea uh, that he'd calculated before on turbulent dispersion in the atmosphere and they wanted to try it out on the ocean. Apparently there were quite a few Scots people there who laughed at these old men who uh, were uh, playing around with parsnips and stopwatches and making measurements but it was really an important uh, point. Now, the other thing that I'll say as a uh, Kingsman might be of interest, in 1953, uh, Kings decided it would have a special research fellowship competition for elderly retired men, of course, we only had men in those days, uh, losing out half our potential ability, but, uh, for retired men who had some research ideas that they wanted to finish. So Richardson applied. He hadn't got the fellowship when he was 21 or something, but he did apply uh, uh, aged about 70, I think. I can't remember the exact details. Um, there's a letter in Kings, which I've seen written by Richardson's wife saying, Mr. Provost, that's the head of uh, King's College. The night before last, Lewis dreamt he'd won the fellowship. The next day, he was so excited. He talked of nothing else, but coming back to King's, doing the work he'd planned, the friends he'd made as an undergraduate, and how he'd meet them again in the King's combination room. 
Mr. Provost, I have to tell you, he died in his sleep last night. So, now, why is this so uh, difficult? I mean, it's only F equals MA, the oceans and the atmospheres. Newton, as you see, he, he knew it was F equals MA. But the important thing with Newton realized is that that is following the particle or parcel on which the force is acting. Now, while the air that's over Cambridge at the moment plays the important role in determining the weather here, it then moves on and I really don't care <laughs> what it does. I want to know what the air conditions are over my house all the time. So I don't want to, to know what happens as I follow the particles. I want to know one fixed spot. Now, in fluid mechanics, in order to do that, you have the Navier-Stokes equation, which is written here, and it's occasionally said that Navier, who you see on the bottom left, wrote down the left-hand side, and Stokes wrote down the right-hand side. Uh, and the difficulty, damn Navier, is because I want to know what the velocity is right here, at the same spot, we have this difficult u dot grad u term, u times the variation of u with space. And that causes an enormous amount of uh, difficulty. If that term wasn't there, the weather would be totally uh, different. And I might say, uh, just as an aside, there's a branch of fluid mechanics, and I've contributed quite a bit to that, which just neglects the left-hand side and says, I oh, hell with it. And there are certain circumstances when this new, the viscosity is very large, then you can forget old Navier and just do Stokes. But that's one of the difficulties. Now, another difficulty is uh, understood through Bayes ballot law, a very important uh, law. And I'll tell you what happens in the Northern Hemisphere. It says that if you have your left hand on the low isobar, as you see here, so the uh, uh, left hand is on the 1008 millibars, and then the right hand is on the higher. Uh, um, isobar, higher pressure, then the wind is in your back. And that doesn't make any sense at all. The point is that there's a higher pressure on the right hand than on the left hand. So hence, you'd think that the flow ought to be from the right hand to the left hand, from high pressure to low pressure. But by Ballast's law, which I assure you is correct, says that the wind is at right angles. How can that be? And the reason is that the Earth is rotating. And something known as the Coriolis force, which says that rotation plays an important role. And somehow, I don't understand how Newton knew that his laws were correct in the inertial system of the stars and not on the rotating Earth, that this Coriolis force plays an important role. Now, as you can understand, not much is known about what the weather would be like if this Coriolis force wasn't in existence, but it would be totally different. It's very important. And uh, a man who, in some sense, uh, made a bigger contribution than anyone is uh, a man called Carl Gustav Rossby. Uh, and after him, there's known the Rossby number, which is a typical velocity u divided by the rate of rotation of the Earth times the typical length scale. And when the Rossby number is small, then the rotation is important. And were the Earth not rotating, the weather would be totally uh, different. But now, this effect is important at all scales. And I'm going to say only half seriously. As a uh, fast bowler uh, from England goes down and plays uh, Australia, does he take into account that the rotation of the earth is in a sense is in an opposite direction? And he should take into account the Rossby number. Now, it's not a big effect because of the 27 yard cricket uh, pitch, but could be the difference between a snick or not. <laughs>
and how many English bowlers or Australian bowlers take that into account. Well, Rossby would have known all about that. And I could spend some time talking about Rossby, but he wasn't anywhere near as colorful a character, I think, a very serious, in some sense, a very capable scientist without uh, a doubt. Uh, then there are others who played a role. Uh, Francis Beaufort uh, was fascinated by weather at sea, and uh, he did quite a lot to revolutionize uh, um, sailing. Uh, then, there, of course, a wonderful meteorologist like Michael Fish, who said uh, one day or one evening, there's no need to be at all worried. There's no storm coming. And the next day, there was one of the biggest storms uh, that England had uh, seen for quite some uh, time. Some indication of why we still need to know a lot is uh, Hurricane Sandy. Just uh, a few years ago, hit New York and caused at least 150 deaths, partially because there was a high tide and that caused uh, difficulties. Katrina in 2005, which uh, wiped uh, through and wiped out a lot of uh, people in uh, the Southern US, the potential damage and the problems had been assessed very clearly in the Scientific American article a few years previously, but somehow uh, notice wasn't taken. Then the situation I like the best in a sense is uh, in the early uh, 21st century, uh, there was to be a fairly big charity event in Southern Ireland. And somebody said at a committee meeting, you know, we're putting a lot of money and effort into this charity event. What happens if it's bad weather? If there's a storm, well, people may not come and we may lose a lot of money. So another committee member said, ah, I know what we do. We take out insurance, that's standard stuff. So uh, the chairman asked uh, a few insurance companies and the cost was enormous. So some other guy said, ah, I know what we do. We asked the Met Office. They're the best uh, weather uh, bureau in the world. They know what they're doing. Let's ask them. We'll tell them uh, that we're organizing this event in two weeks time on a Sunday. And do they suggest we take out uh, um, insurance? So they asked the Met Office. The Met Office came back a few days later and said, look, we'll tell you, we have 10 different programs that we use. This is, I said, early uh, uh, 2000. We have 10 different programs with slight differences. We've run each one of them because we know how important it is. And there's no storm in any of them, in any part of the Southern bit of Ireland. There's a bit of storm in the north, but nothing in the south. Well, you can guess the next line. I won't uh, tell you, but it was a financial disaster. Now to show you that I'm totally up to date uh, from the best scientific journal that I read, the Mail Online, 22nd of April this morning, 8.17. Met Office unveils plans for street by street weather forecasts. So what that means, uh, they're going to get predictions to with 100 yards. What that means is that two lovers are quite frequently going to be on the phone together and say, gee, look, the Met Office has said that the weather's going to be better where you live than where I live. And I'll tell you what, how about I come to your place uh, and I'll be there. It's no more than a five minute walk uh, from my place to your place, but it's going to be much better weather than uh, it is going to be uh, if you came to me. Now, the final take home uh, messages, uh, for thousands of years, humans had no idea how to predict the weather or the associated state of the sea. While the records had been collected for some time, it was really only Mary who was the first to analyze them starting uh, 170 years ago or so. It was Fitzroy who really developed an understanding of sea and the weather. And he was the founder of the British Meteorological Office in 1854, which we can still be proud of. It's the, uh, still the uh, best in the world, but he did it with just three, a staff of three and very little money. 
And then uh, along came Lewis Fry Richardson. He uh, developed numerical methods to uh, predict uh, the uh, weather before going on to initiate many other areas in psychology, possibly preventing uh, war and inventing uh, fractals. Well, that's all I have to say. <laughs>